There we go. Well, if you haven't noticed already, Pastor John's not here. He is up in the Portland area. You know what he's doing there? He's preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. He does that wherever he goes, doesn't he? We're so fortunate to have him here. And by extension, online, on Zoom, <laughs> wherever he goes. Rich did a good job this morning doing the same thing. And that's why you came, right? right? For the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll read a few verses here. Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to start in 11, verse 11, and go to uh, 15. 15. Ephesians 2, 11. Wherefore remember that ye, being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity for us to gather together uh, around your word and focus on it. And we trust your word. We trust your word, Father, to build us up and to edify us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, what I'm going to try and do this morning is do my best. I'm going to erase some of this. I'm going to try and answer the question. Let's put it here. Why the wall? All right. In Ephesians 2, all right, verse 11, we read about the middle wall of partition. Well, why do we have walls anyway, right? Well, many, of, many people feel that there should be a wall on our southern border, right, to keep people from illegally entering into the country. So that wall, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures, but some of the, the governors down there, I think in Texas and in Arizona, they, they built kind of a partial wall using cargo containers, right? <laughs> if you've ever had kids, you've had Legos, Reminds me of Legos, looks like Legos. Um, that doesn't work so well, but what's the purpose of that wall is to keep people out, right? There are walls that, I'm retired from the Orange County Sheriff's Department. I spent most of my time in the Central Men's Jail in Santa Ana, right by the county courthouse, if you've ever been there talking about the courthouse, not the jail. <laughs> they have walls there. They have very thick, sturdy cement walls. Those walls are to keep people in, 
right? So you have some walls to keep people out, some people won't keep them in. How about this wall here in Ephesians 2? Well, I would say that the clue is in the word partition, right? The middle wall of partition, okay? <clears throat> Webster's, the 1828 def uh, definition of partition is the act of dividing the state of being divided, division, separation, distinction. Right. So in Ephesians 2, there's a wall there for separation. Well, what or who is being separated? Right? Right? Well, it, it says in verse 11, something called circumcision and uncircumcision. Right? Who, who are the circumcision? Right? Jews. And the uncircumcision? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles. They're being separated by a wall. Well, we have to ask the question, why? Why is there a wall there for the separation of Jews and Gentiles? Well, to answer that question, we have to go back to the beginning. All the way to the beginning. I know you know the verse, but I'm going to ask you to turn there anyway. Genesis 1.1. Because we're going to look at some other verses here in Genesis as well. So we might as well start at the beginning. <clears throat> and Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Okay. Now, it could have said that God created the universe. And he did. It could have said that he created everything. Right? And he did. But it says here, heaven and earth. For a very specific pers uh, purpose, in God's creation, there are two realms. There's heaven and there's earth. Uh, we know more about the earth, but he created heaven as well. And in heaven, he created some heavenly beings. At the top of the food chain of those beings was an anointed cherub by the name of Lucifer. And in Ezekiel 28, we won't turn there, but in Ezekiel 28, it says that Lucifer was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. And it was his job to lead the worship of God. But somehow, one day, he became so enamored with himself he said, I want to have the worship. I should have the worship. And he started a rebellion against God. In Isaiah, Isaiah 14, it records that he said, I will be, this is Lucifer speaking, I will be like the Most High, referring to God. Now, that title, Most High, in Genesis 14, that was Isaiah 14. If you look at Genesis 14, that's the first time the title Most High is used of God. It says, God, Most High, Possessor of Heaven and Earth. Okay. So the Creator creating the heaven and the earth. He's the possessor. Right? Lucifer says, I will be like the Most High. So what's he saying? He says he wants it. He wants it all. He says, I'm going to be the possessor of heaven and earth. That was the purpose of his rebellion. Look with me back in Genesis uh, chapter 1 at verse 2. 
Well, I'll read the first verse again. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse two, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I'm gonna to suggest to you that Lucifer's, I'm gonna call him Satan from now on, right? Because Satan means the adversary. He became God's adversary when he started his rebellion. And I'm gonna to suggest to you that that rebellion took place in between verse one and verse two. Now, not everybody feels that way, but I'm gonna suggest that to you and you can study that out yourself but I'm gonna give you the reason I feel that way, and that is this phrase, without form and void. It's only used twice in the Bible. Here, Genesis 1, 2, and in Jeremiah chapter four. Please do that, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter four. In Jeremiah chapter 4, Jeremiah is prophesying, uh, prophesying of the future in the land of Israel. I'm going to start at, at 22. It says, For my people is foolish. They have not known me. This is God speaking. They are sottish children, and they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. Verse 23, I beheld the earth and lo, it was, there's our phrase, without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains and lo, they trembled, and all the earth, uh, all the hills moved lightly. I beheld and lo, there was no man. All the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. And all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. For thus saith the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. So what you have here in Jeremiah is the prophecy of a future time in which God is going to, by his fierce anger, pour out wrath in judgment upon the land. Can you think of a time in the future when that's going to take place? Yeah. Right? That's going to be the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, Daniel's 70th week. Uh, we call it great tribulation, right? is a judgment upon the land, right? The results, the aftermath of that judgment is without form and void. So if you go back to Genesis chapter one and verse two, it says the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Okay, that's a result of some kind of judgment Okay, that's why I'm gonna to suggest to you that that rebellion by Satan took place in between verse one and verse two, okay? So after that, we have here a God speaking and God said, let there be light, right? And God said, let the, the firmament uh, above be divided. God said, let the waters be in one place let the earth be, uh, bring forth grass, uh, lights in the heavens, okay? Waters bring forth abundantly the creatures and let the earth bring forth living creatures after their own kind. Okay, look at me at, uh, with me, not at me, but look with me at uh, verse 27. Chapter one, verse 27, so God created Man, in his own image, in the image of God, created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. There's something that needs to be subdued, right? Have dominion 
over, right? The fish of the sea, fowl of the air, and so on. So God made man for a purpose, okay? And it's interesting, he uses these words, subdue, have dominion, right? Um, we're going to come back here, but uh, go with me to uh, Psalm 8. Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is where David says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Okay. <clears throat> In Psalm 8, I'm going to look and read... Uh, I'm going to read verse 4 and down, 4, 5, 6. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, and thou hast put all things under his feet. So there you have the word dominion again. And this is talking about the first man, Adam. He was crowned with glory and honor. He was made to be king over the earth, to subdue and have dominion. Well, this one who had led the rebellion in heaven, Satan, now brings his, the guy that wants to be possessor of heaven and earth, right? He brings his rebellion down to earth and sees that man who's head of the entire planet. And he says, well, he's just in my way, right? He's not going to have dominion over me. He's not going to subdue me. And sure enough, right, in Genesis chapter 3, he leads man to fall. He actually wins man over to his side. Right? Adam, in a sense, joins the rebellion. Adam and Eve. Right? So actually things are looking pretty good for him. That is the adversary. Right? He, he's already led a rebellion up in heaven. And now he's brought it down to earth. Right? But not so fast. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God's going to make a promise here. I'm going to start in verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It's going to be a battle of seeds. Right? It shall bruise thy head, that's the seed of the woman, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So let me ask you, where would you rather be wounded? In the heel or in the head? Right, yeah. Not the head. Not the head. We just, uh, in the uh, zone, I erased it up there, but today we're going to read the book of Ruth. That means we just finished the book of Judges. Judges. Right. In Judges, there was a... Uh, man by the name of Abimelech. Now, he had an army, and he was attacking a city by the name of Thebes. And the people in the city, they ran into a tower for protection. Right, you might, might remember that. And up at the top of the tower, there was a woman. Now, Abimelech is going to try and set fire to the tower to kill the people. He'd already done that in another city called Shechem. Now he's going to do it in this city, Thebes. Okay, so he's getting ready to set that entire tower on fire. It says that the woman took a piece of a millstone and just tossed it over the edge, right? Well, it hits Abimelech in the head. 
It says it break his skull. Uh, he's dying. So he tells his armor bearer, take your sword, run me through, and kill me because I don't want it to be said that I was done in by a woman. Okay? Well, sorry, Abimelech, but it got recorded in the Bible forever and ever. You got killed by a woman. By the way, how did he know it was a woman? Huh? Maybe he would look up, oh, here it comes, <laughs> before he got hit. So that's just a man, Abimelech. What about this creature that is perfect in beauty and full of wisdom? Do you think he's going to sit around and wait to get wounded in the head by the seed of a woman? Yeah. Bless you. <laughs> Do you think he's going to wait around for that? The answer is no. He's going to put a plan in action to destroy the seed of the woman. But we don't know who that is. Okay, after the fall, Adam and Eve were removed from the Garden of Eden. Right? Eve has a child by the name of Cain. She thinks that's the seed of the woman, right? The Lord hath gotten me a man. That's why she named him Cain, right? But it's evident that Cain's not that promised seed of the woman when he kills his brother Abel. So man begins to multiply on the earth. And do you think that man, after the fall, uh, loves God, right? Appreciates God his creator, wants to worship him? Okay, no, he doesn't, because that rebellion has gotten into man. It's not just something that happened on the outside. It got in, in, into man. Okay, turn with me to uh, Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, this is... His plan, Satan's plan. The adversary sends the sons of God, verse 2. His minions, these are angels. These aren't men. The sons of God here are angels. Angels saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days. The offspring of those angels and the daughters of men were giants. Okay. Notice it says also, it says there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, that is after the flood that's coming, this is Satan's strategy to do what? To corrupt the seed of man to destroy the seed, the promised seed of the woman, which is his doom, right? Okay, so his plan was to corrupt man's seed, bringing in these angelic beings and having uh, the produce of which were giants. Okay, he almost does it. <laughs> he almost corrupted the entire human race except for one man. There was one man left that says he was perfect in his generations. That means his lineage didn't have any corruption in it. That is uh, verse 8. Chapter 6, we're still in chapter 6, verse 8 says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and Noah walked with God. Okay, so perfect in generations, that means his seed was still pure, right? Well, we know, we know what happened. The flood came, destroyed everybody except eight people, Noah and his wife and his three, th uh, three sons and their wives, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, right? The promised seed of the woman has to go through Noah 
And it has to come out of one of these three sons. So what I'm trying to do is show you the seed line. By the way, that seed line needs to be, it needs to be protected. That's, that's part of the purpose of the wall. It's going to protect the seed of the woman till he's brought forth. Okay, so there is the flood. Oh, the three sons. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The descendants of Shem were called Shemites, right? Listen to that word, Shemite, Semite. That's where they get the word Semite, right? Those are dis descendants in the Middle East. Those are descendants of, of Shem. Guess who's a descendant of Shem? A man by the name of Abram. Now, after the flood, man still is in rebellion against God. God said, scatter and multiply, replenish the earth. And so what does man do? Man <laughs> sticks together and starts to build a tower, reaching up to heaven. What that really is, is the tower is not going to go all the way up to heaven. It's going up so that they can worship the host of heaven. Right. Not to worship God, but to worship God's adversary and his followers. <clears throat> you know what happened, right? God confuses their language at the Tower of Babel and divides them up into nations. Right. Just to just to say this real quick, uh, if you look at the last uh, last part of uh, chapter ten, uh, verse thirty one. Right, verse thirty one says, "These are the sons of Shem after their families and their tongues and their lands after their nations." Okay, what makes up a nation? What makes up a nation is families, people, tongues, that's their language, in a land with borders, right? So you have all these nations. They're not worshiping God. Okay. God says, I'm going to create my own nation. You're going to start with one man. Now we're looking at Genesis chapter 12. <clears throat> I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So God promises Abram a land. It's going to make him a great nation. You need people to make, to make a nation, right? So he promises Abraham a seed, descendants, and a blessing, right? When you think of the Abrahamic covenant, you think land, seed, blessing, right? This is God's promise to Abraham. There is a problem with that. And the problem is that Abraham and his wife Sarah can't have children, right? But, but I wanted to do this because I wanted to, to use this. This was given to me by Steve Hughes, right? Steve and Anna are here this morning, but I hope they're watching online, right? 
uh, some while ago, he took this and he put it on my table in between the meetings. And uh, I didn't know where it came from. The first time I saw it, I thought, oh, somebody gave me a cigar. <laughs> I thought, I, I don't smoke cigars, but I have relatives who do, and they come in little uh, metal packages like that. But, but it's not. It is a high-powered laser pointer. In fact, I've used it, and I'm afraid to use it on the chart because I think it will put a hole in it. If it starts smoking, you let me know. Right? But here it is. Right? That's, that's pretty... You can see it, right? But what I wanted to point out was, here's Adam down here with the Gentiles. Right? But look where Abraham is. He's up here. It says promise. You see, there starts to be a separation. Right? You can see it starts here. It's going to go all the way up here. Right? It's going to come up here. But right now we're just down here. Right? So what's a wall? Right? It's a separation. It's a division. It's a distinction. And boy, is Abraham going to get a distinction. <laughs> right? He's going to get a sign. It's called a token. Right? That he's different than the Gentiles. Come with me to uh, Genesis 17. Genesis chapter 17. And verse 10, it says, This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Right? It's about the seed. It, the wall is going to be a protection for the seed. Right? Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. So I'm going to do this. Circumcision. Circumcision is part of this wall that is separating Jews from Gentiles. Remember, before, before the, uh, the flood, there were giants in the land. It also said, afterwards, there's going to be giants in the land. Satan is still attempting to corrupt the seed. Now it's the seed of Abraham. He's promised a seed that is going to what? Bring forth the seed, the promised seed of the woman. Okay? Okay, so there you have circumcision. Is this, uh, is this important to God? Yes. Well, yeah. Uh, verse 14. We're in chapter 17 of Genesis. <coughs> chapter 14. And the uncircumcised man, child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people, and he, he hath broken my covenant. So this is a big separation. It's a big division. It's a big distinction, if you will, between the Gentiles and the Jews, Abraham's descendants. Verse 15, And God said unto Abram, as for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name, and I will bless her and give her a son also of her. I should stop for a moment and say, Abraham already has a son by the name of Ishmael. Ishmael. Not from Sarah, but from the bondwoman, Hagar. Okay. That was before Abraham had his flesh cut off, right? Flesh is not going to be accepted by God. Okay. Ishmael is not. Okay. 
Verse 16, I will bless her, give her a son. I will bless her and she shall be the mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said, <laughs> said in his heart, shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is 90 years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. By the way, Abraham fell on his face and laughed. So God's going to say, you're going to name this child laughter. Isaac means him that, him that laughs. He that shall laugh. So that every time he says, Isaac, come over here, right? <laughs> when Isaac is born. Whenever he says, Isaac, oh, I remember I laughed when God told me I was going to have a child. But there he is. There he is. Thou shalt call his name Isaac. Okay, I'm going I'm to start the, the seed line over here. I'll go, go here. I don't know how far I'm going to get. He has has two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Did I put too many S's in there? Yeah. There's actually a little eraser on here. Isaac. <clears throat> I only read half of, uh, of verse 19. And God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Okay, so it's not Ishmael, right? It's Isaac. The seed is going to come through Isaac. Abraham, Isaac. Fast forward. Isaac marries Rebekah. And they have two children. They have twins. They have... Esau and Jacob. Now we know what, I'm going to kind of go through this a little quickly, but you're Bible students. You know that Jacob kind of tricked his father Isaac into giving him the blessing. So Isaac couldn't see too well, right? Esau was not happy about that. <laughs> Jacob feared Esau. So he's going to go back to uh, his relatives that are not in the land of Canaan. But before he leaves, he has a dream. Genesis 28. Genesis chapter 28. So we're trying to follow the, the seed line because it's going to be protected by this wall that is there to protect the seed line. It's going to bring forth the promised seed of the woman, right? <clears throat> verse, verse 12, chapter 28, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending, on it, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, Isaac, the God of Isaac, the land, that's the promised land, whereupon thou liest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed. Right? And thy seed, you see how that's the importance of what the focus is on, the seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, 
and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Okay, that sounds exactly like what God said to Abraham. And he repeated it to Isaac, and now he's going to repeat it to Jacob. Okay, so it's not Esau. The seed is going to go from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. Now Jacob has 12 sons. Okay, I'm going to try and do this quickly. Okay, I, can re I remember Jacob's sons by their mothers. Okay, because <laughs> Jacob has more than one wife. Okay, so Jacob, let's start over here. Jacob's first wife is Leah. Number one, son, Reuben. Two, Simeon. Three, Levi. Four, Judah. His other wife, Rachel, is not bearing children. She's frustrated, so she gives Jacob her handmaid, Bilhah. And from Bilhah, five is Dan, and six is Math, 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 Eli, Naphtali. I leave out a P? There's NAP? Okay. Naphtali. Leah says two can play that game, and so she gives her handmaid to Jacob. I'm starting to feel sorry for Jacob. And She has Gad and Asher. Asher. <clears throat> Leah starts having children again. So nine is Issachar. And 10 is Zebulon, Zebulon, Zebulon. I don't know if that's right. Okay. Now, Rachel starts to bear children. She has 11, yeah. Joseph and 12. Benjamin, she actually uh, dies giving birth to, to Benjamin. Okay, I'm almost out of time here, but uh, so I'm going to have to uh, continue this some other time. But I want to see the seed line is going from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. Now the question is, which one of his children is going to carry the seed line to the promised seed of the woman. Okay, at the end of Jacob's life, go to Genesis 49. At the end of Jacob's life, <clears throat> he prophesies over all of his children. Uh, verse 1. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Verse 2, Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, hearken unto Israel your father. Okay, so now he's going to go one by one. All right, we're not going to read all this, but three, verse 3, you can see Reuben. Verse 5, Simeon and Levi. 
Verse 8, Judah. Listen to what he says about Judah. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. It's another name for their savior, their Messiah. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now I'm sure you noticed in verse 9 that the lion is mentioned three times. Do you know anybody from the tribe of Judah who's called a lion? Right? Sure you do. Right? Revelation chapter 5. Yeah, the revelation. In Revelation chapter 5, right? The apostle John, he's weeping because no one was found worthy to open the scroll. Right? That scroll is the The earth, the possessor, possessing of the earth, the title deed. That's what I'm trying to think of. It's a title deed. No one is worthy to open it up. And he's, the angel says, don't, don't weep, John. The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. I love that, that scene in heaven because he turns to see a lamb. Right, <laughs> standing, a standing lamb as though it had been slain, right? Well, we all know who that is, right? So we can see that this seed line is going to go through Judah, right? We have the, the benefit of having the entire word of God here so that we can see who's going to be there. But my my purpose is, do we have, we have a couple minutes? Well, yeah? Okay. Uh, I don't have a watch, but I have a, a timer. It's counting down. It's going to go off, and I'm going to be, right. I don't want to get caught in the middle of something. Uh, I know that last night... Sorry. It scared me. All right. Last night, you know, I'm new at this, so last night I, I practiced the, giving this, you know, in front of a mirror and with my Bible and looking up verses and see how long it's going to take. It took me way, way, way too long. I knew I wasn't going to finish, but at least that gives me something to preach on next time that John asked me. I can, com I can continue this. In fact, I might even stop here. It might be a good place. I'm going to continue the seed line. But the point of this message is that this seed line needs to be protected because it's going to bring forth the seed of the woman. Who's going to be what? He's going to be the deliverer. He's going to be the guy that is going to uh, crush Satan's head, right? He's going to redeem the nation Israel. He's going to be their Messiah. Eventually, we're going to see, right? He, it says here in verse 10, the scepter shall not depart. What's a scepter? King. Right? A king has a scepter, right? That's the authority, that's the royal authority. So the seed of the woman is not only going to be their Messiah, he's going to be a king. Where? In the land that was promised to Abraham, right? And it's going to be a blessing for the entire earth. People are going to go around singing Psalm 48. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. 
Amen. Amen. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you for your word. We do love it. We do read it. We do believe it. And we thank you that it edifies us. Amen.